reading from the second letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, such confidence we have through Christ toward God, not that of ourselves we are qualified to take credit for anything as coming from us. Rather, our qualification comes from God, who has indeed qualified us as ministers of a new covenant, not of letter, but of spirit. For the letter brings death, but the spirit gives life. Now, if the ministry of death carved in letters on stone was so glorious that the children of Israel could not look intently at the face of Moses because of its glory that was going to fade, how much more will the ministry of the spirit be glorious? For if the ministry of condemnation was glorious, the ministry of righteousness will abound much more in glory. Indeed, what was endowed with glory has come to have no glory in this respect because of the glory that surpasses it. For if what was going to fade was glorious, how much more will what endures be glorious? Verbum Domini. Holy is the Lord our God. Holy is the Lord our God. Extol the Lord our God and worship at his footstool. Holy is he. Holy is the Lord our God. Moses and Aaron were among his priests, and Samuel among those who called upon his name. They called upon the Lord, and he answered them. Holy is the Lord our God. From the pillar of cloud, he spoke to them. They heard his decrees and the law he gave them. O Lord, Lord, oh Lord our God, you answered them. A forgiving God you were to them, though requiting their misdeeds. Holy is the Lord our God. Extol the Lord our God and worship at his holy mountain, for holy is the Lord our God. Holy is the Lord. Sancti Evangelii secundum Mateum. Gloria Jesus said to his disciples, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. Amen, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or the smallest part of a letter will pass from the law until all things have taken place. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do so will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever obeys and teaches these commandments will be called greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Verbum Domini. O 
was thinking about Brother Matthew, now ordained deacon, on a feast of St. Ephraim, who in the Eastern Church we call the Harp of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and I'd like to point out to him the other day in the sacristy that there are only two deacon saints who didn't get killed to become saints. The rest had to kill them. Remember that, deacon? But one of them is, of course, St. Francis, and the other is St. Ephraim. And uh, the brother's ability to sing, as well as being a Franciscan, he sort of has a lot of hope there for him. But that actually points to something I think we need to look at in today's reading. One of the difficulties we have in the present state of our society is that there is a fear to develop purpose. There is, for many people in our culture, no ability, no basis for determining the purpose of life. They don't want to talk about truth and their relativism. They prefer, in our culture, to let art be all about expressing me rather than expressing beauty and having norms of beauty that I want to portray to the world in order to elevate the world by goodness and beauty. And it's hard in our culture even to talk about what is good. People have a pretty good sense of evil because they're doing it. And they have a pretty good sense of evil because they like pointing it out in the people they don't like. And they do that a lot in various areas of our society. Uh, we see it uh, in politics and entertainment where they're happy to point out the badness, but really having goodness as a goal is very vague in the mind of many of our contemporaries. And then to have an ultimate purpose in life of going to heaven to be with God our Lord for all eternity that is really put behind. I've been studying some of the social encyclicals of Pope Leo XIII, and he talks about how not only for the individual, but for human society and the state itself, it is important to realize the purpose ultimately is to go to heaven. That's our goal. And that our lives are to be directed toward that. And that is not the case at this point for large portions of our culture. It, their purpose is in some ways split between two conflicting concerns. On one hand, because so many people believe that we evolved in a random way, evolution of the universe happened by accident. They themselves uh, exist as an accident. Human beings exist by the environment and accidents of the environment, though when they start expounding that thought, I am very frequent to also point out, if that is true, that you are just part of a series of accidental events in history, and there's no purpose to it, just drifting, then it would also be true that your idea that everything is an accident is itself an accident of history. 
and has no logical imperative. But I digress. The, besides seeing everything as an accident, the other enemy of purposefulness is that I focus on the immediacy of this life. I have to get wealth now. I have to get pleasures now. I have to get power now. A lot of folks really are striving to get power. You know, and that's, that's a big goal. I got, I got to be in charge. I'll make a better society, but I've got to be in charge. And there's no ultimate goal to that. What is the purpose for all eternity of what you're seeking? What are you trying to accomplish? It's in that kind of context of our society that I really love this opening of Saint, the reading from St. Paul's letter to 2 Corinthians, where, second letter to the Corinthians, such confidence we have through Christ toward God. On one hand, in our culture, which finds it difficult to state what your reason for living is, or when you do state, well, it's to, to get a, a certain car. Once you get that car, or that house, or that amount of money, or whatever it is you think is your real goal. And then what do you do? And so what you have in a culture that is drifting without a goal, without a purpose, is that people will seek to have self-confidence based on a feeling rather than on accomplishment. How many, uh, we see it all the time, everybody gets a, a, a trophy. I never got trophies. I'm the kid growing up. You had to have somebody who was the last one picked to play baseball. You know, I, 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 and I never won trophies, just I wasn't competent. And so I could not build up self-confidence on my accomplishments in the baseball field or anywhere else in sports. I just was too clumsy, among other things. And yet nobody would build up a confidence on how, what would you like to feel confident? Well, yeah, but not if it's based on emptiness. And this is something that gets promoted in our culture of drifting. False self-confidence for its own sake for people who don't know where they're going once they get competence or confidence. And St. Paul says, we have confidence through Christ. Well, and this is something where our confidence comes from what Christ has accomplished by his life and the way he taught, and the way he lived. Our confidence comes from his death, by which our sins are not just self-confidently ignored, but in the reality of who I am, I can own up to my sins, confess them, and have confidence that the power of Christ's death on the cross is more powerful in its goodness and self-sacrifice than are my sins. And in his resurrection, we have confidence that even though death is inevitable, that's one of the reasons why we need to understand God's purpose for us as being with him for all eternity. Life is short. For some people, very short. But even for a lot of older folks, they may feel tired in their old age because they're just worn out. But they also say, I don't know where the years go. Every old person I know says, where did it all go? It's gone by so quickly. 
Life's shortness is part of existence. And therefore, we must have an understanding of the meaning of death itself. Is this just meaningless absurdity? Which is what the drifters through the universe have. That's all they've got. As they aimlessly drift as part of accidents of history and, and evolution and all these things they hold, it's, it's, they're just drifting along, and it's an absurdity that they're going to die, so they commit suicide, bringing the death more quickly, rather than finding meaning to it. And then, of course, by committing suicide out of despair, make themselves ready for hell. No, we have the resurrection of Christ that is more powerful than death itself. So much so that when Paul teaches about the resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15, and he goes through, he says, God will subdue everything under Christ's feet. And the last enemy will be death itself. Death is Christ's enemy. And his resurrection gives us confidence that he will overcome that too. And because of the power of his resurrection to defeat death as his enemy, in a culture where death, among people whose lives are lived in absurdity, people who are drifting, and they make death their ally. That's why they promote abortion. And now uh, they promote assisted suicide. No, they make death their That's why people who had great schemes that were limited only to this life, to make perfect societies where everybody in this life, which is all you live for, would be perfect people. They used death to get rid of the imperfect. The Nazis killing Jews, gypsies, homosexuals, and others because they wanted a perfect socialist society, and death was their ally. The communists using death as their ally to get rid of capitalists. This is, the, and, and people get rid of believers in God. They wanted a perfect society on this earth, and by that focus only on this earth without any other greater purpose for society, for the government, for the economy, than material desires. They use death as their ally, while Christ gives us a true confidence that death is his enemy, and he has defeated it by his own resurrection from the dead. This is what we see here. That's why he immediately says, it's not of ourselves that we're qualified to take credit. I didn't do it. Paul knows he didn't do it. He was trying to stop the spread of the Christian faith in his own life. But our qualification comes from God, who makes us ministers of a new covenant. I'll be praying Eucharistic prayer number four today because you see there how many covenants were made, but Christ comes and makes the new and everlasting covenant. He first introduces that new covenant at the Last Supper and then immediately says to the apostles who are there for the Last Supper, not just something that they are to receive then and there, and then it's all over, but rather he tells them, do this in remembrance of me. Bringing out that this covenant is made in the sacrifice of Christ himself and that they are to continue offering that sacrifice, that word do in remembrance, are terms from uh, Israelite sacrifices. As you read the use of the word do to offer sacrifice in remembrance is a type of sacrifice in the book of Leviticus and Exodus. 
And so being a minister of this new covenant is what Christ established at the Last Supper. And St. Paul also mentions that in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 25, uh, 25 and 26, that this is where he understands the basis of this. So it's not self-confidence as a feeling that he has, but it's rather something he is commissioned by Christ to do by the power of what Christ has accomplished. That's the basis of our confidence. And in this, we see it as a ministry of righteousness that leads to glory. So in this same text, that he's, he talks about how the glory of this new covenant in the spirit who gives life, he enlivens us in this life, during our time on earth, but the same Holy Spirit will continue to enliven us in the next life toward which we're going. And the righteousness that we are to live in this new covenant today is so that in heaven itself, it will be a life of goodness and righteousness and beauty and that we look towards it. And some people are afraid that if we talk too much about our goal of not going to hell and making sure we do go to heaven, we talk about then we won't care about this world. But it's just the opposite. The opposite happens in the history of the church. Because the people of the church look forward to righteousness in heaven and goodness in heaven and the eternal life with God in all of its beauty, that has inspired Christians through the centuries. The Catholic Church in particular, because we're so, we've been around so long, we make beautiful churches and beautiful art, not as self-expressions, but as little glimpses of heaven. We also seek that goodness and righteousness so that we start orphanages. We invented orphanages, the mental institution, hospitals. These are gifts that came because Christians who sought God and see a purpose in life, also see that in order to live this life well and righteously, we must be doing what is righteous and good and beautiful now as a direction towards the ultimate goal of having that for all eternity. So that the confidence that we have to do these great gifts I, and again, the Catholics even invented the university because we love learning. We invented the school system. The Jesuits came up with the first school system in the 16th century. And all of these different gifts that we've passed on to culture, sometimes they take from us and mess up because they are purposeless. They're without goal. But when we keep ourselves focused, that we do this through Christ and, as he says here, toward God, for the glory that never will fade, then there will be this constant purification of our own personal lives and of the good works that God calls us to do. As he said, in, Paul says to the Ephesians in chapter 2, that you are called to faith in order to do good works. This is the result of this faith that we have that gives us purpose. And this is why Christ in the gospel even says, I came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. Purpose, direction. This is what Christ is giving us. And what we very much need to profess in our own culture today.